the invisible God, he is the visible representation of. That's the idea. Jesus is God's image. So Paul identifies Jesus, whom he presents as the image of God, and he identifies him in these verses that are going to follow, the image of the invisible God. He identifies him both as creator God and as reconciler God. So as the image is held up in front of us, and as Paul describes the image, he says, Jesus is creator God. We know what happened to that. We know about rebellion and sin. And he is reconciler God. Once wronged as creator, he reconciles humanity to himself by his blood shed on the cross. I can stop there, you've got the idea. Can you feel short change? There's more to say. But if you don't get anything else, get that. Jesus is the image of God showing God to us. So far as we can bear. And the two points that Paul demonstrates the character and the reality of God to us through Jesus is this. Creator, reconciler. Through his blood shed on the cross. Christ's followers then have their icon. The nations had their icons. Their, well, they weren't icons actually. They were empty vanities. So they weren't icons. They were idols. That's the difference, isn't it, between an icon and an idol. An icon has got something in it. It's real and true and so on. The idol is an empty vanity. There's Jesus, not a lie like an idol, but an icon of the character of God, showing us so much as of his true character as sinful flesh can benefit from and bear to sustain. And in these verses, the two things picked out about God that Jesus demonstrates are that he's your creator against whom you've sinned, and he's the one who takes that and reconciles you to God by paying the price of your sin. Jesus is God's icon. Icon Acon meaning image. It's used in Paul on a number of occasions, not only with reference to Christ as the image of God, here, and in 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, it's about Jesus. But also the implication of it, of the increasing transformation of the people who follow Jesus into that same image of God, by the power of the indwelling spirit. So if you look at it, if you look at the icon, if you look at Jesus and then spend time meditating on over him, Increasingly doing so transforms you yourself into the image of God. You increasingly become a restored humanity. Now, just a minute. The first place we come across uh, this talk of the image of God is where? I know you better argue because I'm waking up with a question. It goes in it. Genesis. Genesis. Thank you. Genesis chapter 1, 26 and 7. God says, Let us make man in our image. And he does. There's perfect humanity, in perfect world, the image of God, the representation of God to the rest of creation. There to be like God, to keep God's laws, and so on and so on, and to represent the spirituality and the creativeness, creativity. Uh, that word doesn't exist, we'll try another one. The creativity of God to the creation and to represent authority. To the creation. You know, sin comes into the world. You know, the whole image of God in man is marred and is spoiled. And it all goes down the pan from there, doesn't it? And all of a sudden, there are idols springing up everywhere. Murder happens. Stuff goes wrong. The world's a mess. And the nations have their idols. And Israel is affected by those idols and soaks up far too much of it around the edges because it's visual and it's appealing. And then ultimately, God sends Jesus. And here's Jesus, man as man was intended to be, in the image of God. And here he comes, he's the icon of God to us again. He's the one who's representing to us again what God is like. And what humanity should be like. As God's image for that. But he's doing it in a fallen world. In a singular, in a special sense then, Jesus is the image and glory of God, as Paul says, 1 Corinthians 11, 7. He's the image and the glory of God. So this Jesus is God's image idea speaks about Jesus coming into the fallen creation, where mankind is now only a fallen, poor reflection to creation of God's glory, revealing God to us clearly once more as our focus of discovery and of worship and transformation as we increasingly meditate on and follow him.
for those Colossian heretics. Insisting on the spiritually harmful false assumption that true God can't be seen and certainly can't be in the flesh, Paul identifies Jesus, who he presents as the image of God, as creator God, and as God made physical flesh. Those th two things together all at once. And that leaks straight into the next positive statement about Christ's relationship to creation. He is the icon of God, the vi visual representation of God, the invisible God to the world. But there's more to say about him than that because... Uh, He sustained a certain relationship to creation that you may not have thought of straight away, says Paul. Here is the one who represents God to you, but he does so not as a picture, not as a drawing, not as an image a projectionist might shoot onto a wall. He represents God to you as God. Now that's, that's really important. People talk about uh, Jesus just being the image of God, or just being the firstborn of the creation and so on, and they, they fail to recognise what the following context then says. It says he is God. It says he is God showing to you God. The creator God.